Hi everyone, this is Caitlin from grassfedgirl.com and today we have a big treat. We have Robert Sykes from the Keto Savage. He is here. It is going to be fun. Welcome, Robert. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So, uh, you know, some people probably follow you on Instagram or have seen your posts and and uh, familiar with you, but others are not. So tell them your story and what got you into fitness and health and all that. Yeah, so I've been keto now for about five or six years in total. I've been bodybuilding for about 10, natural bodybuilder, and I've I've kind of run the gamut as far as all the different dieting protocols are concerned. I did flexible dieting for a while. If it fits your macros, you know, all the carb ups, and I just never felt great, never felt optimal, struggled with a bunch of eating disorders, and just was never healthy. And then I kind of started dabbling into this keto, low-carb space and have just felt uh, so much better, performed so much better, and haven't looked back. I, I benefited so much from it personally that I kind of made it my life's mission to educate others about the, the nutrition. And like I said, it's just been the most rewarding thing ever. There's there's a whole lot of confusion and ignorance in the bodybuilding space about you have to have carbs to build muscle, you have to have carbs for energy, and that's just not been the case for me. And it's not been the case for many people. Like There's just so much ignorance around that topic, specifically in the fitness industry, that I've wanted to kind of shed some light onto what's possible because I truly feel like you know, if you get your ketogenic diet dialed in and you're benefiting from a performance standpoint, there's no reason you can't obtain and actually optimize your health uh, in the absence of carbohydrates. So that's kind of what I've been building and promoting ever since. Well, that is, I mean, because I had a teacher that was into bodybuilding and everything, and it was always being the drum of that, that you got to have, it's almost like you have, was, what do they say, like to like shuttle the the glucose into the cell and it was yeah. like to build your mitochondria and it was just like he was just like beating it into our heads every day and he was crazy i mean he was in great shape but then he he did have a heart attack a few years ago <laughs> so, probably not the best shape internally then huh yeah but he never did i mean i'm still friends with with him and his wife and i'm always trying to see like don't you follow anything that i'm doing but they don't seem to have changed um anyway so what so you are kind of a you're kind of you know you do your keto bricks and but you do you do you you are kind of carnivore right yeah i mean i don't really eat that much vegetation at all i, I mean every once in a while like <laughs> i can't honestly tell you the last time i had vegetables um but i kind of do like a meat and bricks protocol so carnivore-esque i mean I love meat. I gravitate towards meat. I feel much better with meat. I don't feel any performance gain from eating a bunch of vegetation. I just feel bloat. It's just not optimal. But the bricks have been handy because it's just a really good way to bump my fat ratio up because I do perform better at a higher fat intake. So if I'm doing, you know, meats, it's pretty easy to do like a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to protein. If you're doing carnivore, that's kind of where things gravitate naturally. But I personally perform better at like a you know, 75 plus, 78% of my calories coming from fat. So I'll incorporate the keto bricks to just bump that ratio up a little bit. And that's kind of my sweet spot. Yeah, that is a challenge. I see people on the, with carnivore, they have trouble getting that fat up. And, and it's hard because the meat that's in the store is so lean. Everything is, all the fat's cut off. I mean, you almost have to go way out of your way to find more fatty meat and mm -hmm. um, so that is a good option so what is your keto bricks made out of uh so it's got it's based out of a uh, cacao butter is the base and then we've got um you know, depending on the flavor we've got certain ingredients like mct oil powder we've got uh cacao nibs we've got um you know, we have a peanut butter flavor that's probably the most popular, which obviously has peanut butter in it. Uh, we've got a toasted almond coconut. We have one that's, you know, got coconut flakes, coconut chips. We've got a new flavor that's launching uh, here soon, and that's going to be using a 100% grass-fed whey concentrate, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, so, yeah, it just kind of depends on the flavor, but they're all super clean, super simple ingredients. They're very low total carbs. Most of the, the keto bars on the market are just... Like they're playing the whole net carb game and I've never played the net carb game. Like if you're having to go through a 
you know, mathematical equation to come to what your net carbs are. It's just that you're not being honest with yourself. So I've always advocated counting total carbs and being honest with yourself. Um, and all of our bricks are very low total carbs, very high fat, moderate protein, like a true ketogenic uh, bar. That's good. I mean, I think people are so delusional. And I was for many years, I would calculate all these. And I think my carbs got way too high. And I was just so reliant on that minusing fiber that it was like, yeah. okay, um, how many carbs did you really have? Like a hundred, you know, that yeah, exactly. Like, not really, <laughs> you're not really in your keto zone there. Yeah, and there's so much, I mean, even if you're not having the the fiber, like if it's not impacting your blood glucose, like there are some definite fiber, you know, filler ingredients in certain products that don't really have a, you know, quote unquote negative impact on your blood glucose. You don't see a spike, but that doesn't mean it's not having an impact on your body. I mean, there's still calories there. Your body's still having to process and do something with that food. I mean, there's no free lunch when it comes to nutrition. There's no you know, negative effect or there's no net like zero effect. Like it's either going to be a positive or negative effect. And my whole approach to it is if it's not benefiting me, if it's not improving my performance, then why have it in the first place? And there's been so much, you know, research indicates that fiber is not a necessity by any means. A lot of these fibers just have a lot of GI disruptive, you know, capabilities to them. I don't want any of that noise in my product. So the keto brick is a very low total carb, uh, you know, product for that very reason. So you mentioned some about, you know, and I saw this a lot when I was a personal trainer about eating disorders. I saw that a lot in the other trainers and even in the men trainers, it wasn't just a women thing. Um, and one of my trainers, he was a the manager. He actually, I believe, I mean, he he passed away and I think it, he was very young and I think it was due to the extremes that he was putting his body through and maybe opened himself to, up to an infection or something like that because his immune system was damaged. Um, anyway, so I think it's very dangerous to sometimes follow these unrealistic norms and things. So tell us a little bit about your history with that. Yeah. So, I mean, when I was doing the, you know, the traditional bodybuilding approach of, you know, flexible dieting, eating six meals a day, eating every two hours, you know, I, I bulked up and did like a stereotypical dirty bulk thinking that I needed to do that to put on a lot of muscle. I got up to 230 pounds and I'm only five, eight. So I, that was not a really good look for me. It wasn't healthy. Um, I was eating a bunch of heavily processed carbohydrates and then I cut down for my first competition and I lost like 70 pounds in the first 12 weeks or something crazy. Um, so very unhealthy, very just not not a healthy approach to, uh, you know, sustainable body composition. And I lost a lot of muscle in that process. And then after that was over, I reversed diet and I gained so much weight so quickly because I didn't do it properly. And, and that's when I kind of developed my eating disorders. I'd worked so hard for so long to achieve this lean physique. And then I seemingly threw it away overnight by just, you know, binging on foods. Um, and that just became this negative feedback loop with, you know, overeating and then undereating and binging and purging. And it just wasn't sustainable. It wasn't healthy. And I knew there had to be a better alternative to that. Uh, that's kind of when I started dabbling into different types of dieting. I fell into carbohydrate backloading, uh, which is basically keto during the day and then a lot of carbs at night. But I noticed that I felt better without the carbs at night. So huh. I just skipped those entirely and lo and behold that was keto of course it wasn't really known as keto at the time i mean when i when i started doing keto there was there was zero information on keto like it's not near the hyped up diet that it is now um, but i just noticed that i felt so much better without the carbohydrates um and that was my performance improved i noticed my relationship with food improved my hormones improved my acne cleared up i mean everything that you would hope to have achieved in a proper healthy lifestyle was was happening without these carbohydrates so that's what i know is on something and i stuck with that and i've since kind of uh, you know refined the process figure out what ratios i perform best at what micronutrients i need what what intake of dietary fat and protein i need to really achieve a certain goal whether that be build muscle or lose body fat and it's just totally doable without carbs and honestly totally optimal without carbs I 
think sometimes I don't I'm sure you probably read it's an older book from Nora Gagaudis and she says that you know people will just find any rationalization to get their carbs because they want them so bad mm -hmm. that they'll just make up a reason that you have to have them and uh, she was a she was kind of a pioneer in the keto space but she didn't even call it keto but yeah uh, that we just <clears throat> we just want that we're so addicted to them that we'll come up with reasons yeah it's it's funny because it's so much of it's just human nature like we convince ourselves and we justify these things that we do or these foods that we consume but if you can look at it from a very unbiased you know standpoint like okay Let's track the data. Let's see how my body responds. Let's adjust accordingly and go from there. I mean, there's literally been no instance in which I've benefited from, you know, the carbohydrates or the traditional, you know, dieting approach in the sense of the word, you know, eating more frequently, uh, you know, all these things that you hear that you're supposed to do. You know, you're, you're told, you grow up told that you have to eat every two or three hours to increase metabolism. I mean, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, there's just so much bad information out there. So being able to be objective about what's happening and then being self-aware enough to know what you're doing out of, you know, actual body awareness versus, you know, your just mental inclination to increase your intake of foods that you enjoy eating is key. I mean, being honest with yourself and having that self-awareness is absolutely important. Yes. It's, yeah. I think we have to have kind of a come to Jesus moment about how we really feel and, that's what carnivore being so clean with what I eat then I can tell right away like yesterday I ate a little guacamole and then all night I had leg cramps <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like okay well I, you know I don't know if it was the onion or or what but does something didn't you know didn't go right but you know I'm not gonna die but I'll don't need to eat that every day <laughs> yeah like having that I'm not really a uh, you know, moderation. I'm more of an elimination over moderation kind of guy, but there are certain foods. I mean, there's literally like a keto alternative to every carbohydrate based food out there. So if you're going to have, you know, cheesecake on a special occasion, you know, eat a keto cheesecake and be better off for it. Uh, but don't eat a keto cheesecake every single day. You know, like I had one on my, my wedding day um, and that totally satisfied that craving. It was a nice, pleasant, you know, change of pace, but it's not something I feel like I have to eat every day, and it's not something that's going to have near the negative impact on me as like a traditional cheesecake would. So understanding that, knowing kind of what you're, what you're inclined to do, knowing what your personal boundaries are, uh, and just acting accordingly is is important. Yeah, I mean, I it was interesting uh, yesterday. Oh, they told me start taking my blood sugar. Is either take that that whatever they give you some kind of jelly or some kind of horrible sugar bomb at the doctor and they said or you can bring us two weeks of stick in your finger for your blood sugar and i was like okay i can do that at home i have the stuff and so i started doing it and yesterday i ate like a little bit of artificial sweetener i mean like a keto sweetener mm -hmm. and my blood sugar after that was 130 Whereas when I eat meat, it's never more than like 90. And I was like, oh. <laughs> that's uh, what kind of, it was like stevia or what was it? I think it was allulose. Oh, so, really? So I was like, it was just interesting to see, that, okay, this does affect you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. There's there's really no free lunch. I mean, the allulose, that, that's, that's got, gained a ton of popularity lately because some people don't have a blood glucose response to it. But... A lot of people do. So really knowing and testing and seeing how your body responds is, is key. Like make yeah. friends with the data for sure because the data the data doesn't lie. And I mean I'd never seen my blood sugar above a hundred in years. So I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> now, um, I know you were gonna do a show this spring or something and did it get cancelled or something? Yeah, it got cancelled. I was gonna do several. I had like I had all kinds of shows planned out. Uh, but I've been prepping for this show since November 4th. So I, I skipped out on the Thanksgiving dinners and all the Christmas dinners and all this time spent dying. And one week before the show was supposed to happen, it got canceled because of this COVID virus. So definitely put my world upside down. But you did your pictures anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I scheduled a photo shoot basically to fall on the same day the show would have been. 
and made the photo shoot kind of like my you know finale so to speak so you got you had to you get you got the it's like you sh- you, you showed up you got the pictures you proved you were there <laughs> yeah 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 i mean when you look at what bodybuilding is at its core it's, it's not really like you do compete against other people for sure and that's great but it's a it's an individual sport like you're trying to beat yourself so i wanted to have those pictures. I wanted to follow through with it. I wanted to see it through to the end and then see if I was able to improve my physique from what it was the last time I'd competed. And I feel like I had done that for sure. I learned a lot in the process and, um, I would, I considered it a win in the book for, for sure. Well, I think in, <clears throat> in light of recent events, I think, you know, following through with it is a really strong decision. And, um, I know my little brother did a he did a bodybuilding thing one time and he got really really lean he's six five Mm -hmm. he was like really um, dramatic and uh, he kind of has a football body sort of and uh he said arnold schwarzenegger says make your own show (laughs) yeah it's what he used to tell me i'm like okay sounds good yeah you get i mean it really is cool when you see other people that have done the sport, gone through it, and seen the, you know, the light on the other side, so to speak. It's, it's such a mental challenge. I mean, when you have to be just the epitome of disciplined and, and consistent when nobody else around you is, or, you know, just be incredibly hungry because you have to be very strict on your macronutrient, track everything, and just get things dialed in, uh, you know, when food is all around you. I mean, it's it's very tough. It's very mentally trying, but it's so rewarding because you just gain this newfound appreciation for what yourself, for what you're capable of, uh, and like how your body responds. I mean, you you have such a pulse on how your body responds to different variables, different macronutrients, different ratios, different training, you know, stimulus. It's just it's just crazy what you learn about yourself in the process. So tell us like a typical day of when you were doing your hardcore training and then like a regular day when you're just kind of doing your working around your business and stuff. So the, honestly, the training doesn't really change. I keep that pretty much consistent, whether I'm in the off season or in a contest prep, the nutrition changes quite a bit. Uh, I'm just tracking more closely and gradually restricting those calories um, and getting things dialed in. But typical day for me, is I wake up at three, I start working on, you know, clients and emails and business stuff. And then I'll train typically around five in the morning. Uh, the training lasts, you know, usually about an hour and a half. Then I'll go for a run uh, as my form of cardio slash meditation. That's kind of when I listen to podcasts or listen to audio books, come back, shower, have a meal, and then start the day. You know, I'll have my, the crew here with the keto brick, uh, you know, compound. So they'll be working and then I'll be doing podcasts. I'll be recording videos. I'll be working with them, and uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much how the day goes. And then afterwards, I'll try and get to bed at a decent time, and uh, you know, spend some time with Crystal, maybe grill a steak, shoot the bow, something like that. Um, so, how much of your food is meat, and how much of it is keto brick? Uh, it's, so it just depends on what my caloric intake is for the day. But usually, like in a maintenance, I think I'm right at about 3,700 calories uh, as a maintenance. So I'll typically have one keto brick a day and then the rest will be comprised of, uh, you know, some variation of meats or eggs. Um, And depending on what my fat ratio is at that given time, I'll have a leaner cut or a fattier cut. If I'm doing, you know, ribeye, like if I'm doing steak, I'll go with a ribeye. Um, Or if I'm doing ground beef, I'll alternate between like a 75-25 or, you know, an 80-20 or something like that. I eat a lot of uh, wild game as well. So if I'm doing more wild game, I'll try and increase more uh, dietary fat somehow or another because it's all wild game is very lean. Yeah, that's that's hard to get that <laughs> to taste. You got to have some technique there, I guess. Yeah, you just can't overcook the wild game because it's it'll it'll definitely turn into shoe leather if you overcook it. It's kind of like grass-fed beef is the same way. It's like you want to undercook it. Mm-hmm. so um what do you see in the future for your training and for your business uh so as a natural bodybuilder you want to take some time off in between each you know cutting cycle um that way you want to you you have to be at a, a surplus or a maintenance long enough to put on some lean tissue 
and if you're dieting for six months or or longer it, it can take some time in between doing shows so i probably won't lean down for another two and a half three years so i'll focus on putting on some quality muscle during that time and then as far as the business goes i've got a lot of things in the works right now we've got um, a lot of exciting things that i don't want to come out with publicly just yet but uh crystal my wife she's got some big announcements this week um she's launching a new business and then keto brooks can continue to grow we've We've made some big moves uh, with that. That'll be unveiled here soon. And then, um, yeah, we, we're just keep continuing to grow the brand and, and build the business and be the best we can be with it. That's exciting. Yeah, I follow her on Instagram. She's always doing something new. <laughs> yeah, she's a rock star. Yeah, you're lucky you got somebody who's on your wavelength. Mm-hmm, totally. I would not, like, my husband getting up at three in the morning. I tell you. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> well, Chris was not as much of an early riser as I am, but she's <laughs> um, she's she started to wake up more and more early each day, so she's getting there. <laughs> Just don't don't bother me. Yeah. Do whatever you want. But, um, so tell us what what do you think about people who have gained a lot of weight during quarantine? Give them some tips that they can do to help themselves the main thing they can do is not make excuses i feel like a lot of people are using this time and just making excuses now i am very grateful in the fact that i've got my own home gym here so i haven't really had to change my training but a lot of people you know are stuck with body weight or resistance band you know exercises but that's totally doable i mean you can make like one of our uh, crew members here brandon he he trains exclusively with body weight calisthenics and resistance bands so not making excuses while the gyms are being shut down is is a huge first step. Uh, not letting your nutrition, you know, go to crap while you're while you're in quarantine is key too. I mean, you you are the only one in control of what you put in your mouth and how you expend your energy. So, uh, you know, taking ownership in that and and actually working on it is going to be key, regardless of what the quarantine situation is. That'd be my my first tip for sure. Yeah, Robert's not going to take any of your excuse, your crap excuses. <laughs> that is very true. I'm not one for excuses. <laughs> so, um, what do you think about this meat shortage? Do you think it's real or what? I don't know. I feel, again, lucky because I've got access to a bunch of wild game. I mean, I can go hunt and, and fill the freezer that way if I need to. Um, it is weird, though, because, like, the meat prices have definitely increased and... I don't know. It's just, it's just a weird, it's a weird, strange, it's a very strange time we're living in, but I feel like we just need to make the most of it, be positive, be realistic, but also be optimistic. Um, and we'll all get through this together. I don't like the whole vegetarian propaganda that's coming along with, you know, the increased uh, meat costs and whatnot. I feel like people need to be smart. People need to look at the, look at the data, just like they would the data with their own health endeavors, you know, and, and recognizing that you know meat is not the problem we got to stay on top of what the the actual solution to these issues are and um i don't want to deprive people of meat because that's a good nutrient dense source of food that's going to empower us to to keep getting healthier and healthier so i will be eating a lot of meat throughout this whole time i can assure you that <laughs> absolutely now i know you probably advise your wife on her training do you have any tips for women training uh, yeah, as far as training goes, I mean, a lot of a lot of females I find try and gravitate away from the, uh, you know, quote unquote more, I guess, like the, the compound movements that they, they can be kind of scary at first, especially if they don't really have a background in training, you know, like the heavy squats and deadlifts and compound movements of that nature. But those really are the, the best movements you can do. I mean, simply going back to basics and and doing those heavier compound movements is key. Uh, make sure you have good form, uh, you know, make sure you're being safe about it, you know, have a, have a lifting belt. Uh, you don't want to have poor form and get yourself injured, but not being intimidated by these, you know, quote unquote, more manly exercises and just learning proper form and then executing them properly is, is going to be key for you, whatever your, your health goals are. So, I mean, and it can be, especially in the gym, it's very intimidating to use those big squat racks and stuff how do you think women should learn that i mean if you if you can just go on youtube honestly like my exercise 
history. Like I, I learned pretty much every exercise that I do watching YouTube videos. Uh, I didn't ever have a trainer growing up. I did never, you know, had an advisor in that regard. So I would just watch professional bodybuilders on YouTube and kind of learn what movements they were doing and then adjust them. And as I learned more about my body and how the mechanics of training works, you know, you can start to feel how different variations to the, to the exercise, the movement can affect how your muscles working uh, throughout that movement. But, you know, if you don't have any basis for information, I mean, go to YouTube, watch some reputable sources, learn some technique, and then uh, apply that technique, experiment with it and be mindful of how your body feels in response to those, those uh, movements. Don't try and go crazy heavy right out of the gates, you know, fo focus on form and proper, um, you know, proper technique first and foremost. Is there anyone you particularly follow or? Uh, for for movements, um, let's see here. On it, uh, the on it brand, they've got a lot of tutorial videos on YouTube. So that'd be a pretty good place to start for sure. You just don't want to follow somebody like those CrossFit fails or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if it says CrossFit fails in the title, don't go get your <laughs> techniques from them. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> face plant. Yeah. So, no um, well, awesome. So is Crystal uh, carnivore-ish too? Uh, she doesn't. She doesn't eat that much red meat. She likes chicken. She doesn't like seafood. She just eats a lot of chicken. Uh, but she'll have some more vegetables than I will for sure. But uh, she's not eating a ton of carbs by any means. I mean, she keeps her total carb count down below twenty a day. Uh, so there's not just a whole lot of vegetables that come with that. So predominantly meat for sure. She'll eat a lot of pork, a lot of chicken. Um, she does a lot of, uh, you know, high quality yogurt. She does like her yogurts, uh, but yeah, more or less, not carnivore, but uh, carnivore-ish, I guess. <laughs> most, much more than most women. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, have you got any collaborations? So, I know you're buddies with Dr. Barry. You doing anything with him? Coming uh, up. So nothing formal. Um, I'm kind of trying to kind of wait and see what happens with this whole virus thing. We had a whole bunch of conferences planned. Like mm -hmm. we had, we were going to be traveling for six months straight uh, at all these conferences, and then all those just got canceled. So that kind of put a wrench in our plans for collaborations. But um, when all this blows over, I'll, I'll pick up the phone, dial up all the 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 community, and we'll we'll get something in the works for sure. With Danny or. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Danny and I, I need to get Danny down to the farm. We go hunting again. It's always fun hanging out with Danny. Yeah, that sounds fun. So do you buy meat from the grocery or do you go to the local store? Or? Uh, so most of the meat I get is uh, either stuff that I've killed over the years or I'll get a lot of it from, you know, local sources. If we can find some local sources, my parents raised lamb. So we'll go over there, slaughter a lamb and have fresh lamb. Um, which is nice. And then um, a lot of it we'll get from Whole Foods. We have a Whole Foods here, so they've got pretty good quality stuff. Uh, so we'll go there as well. Awesome. Well, uh, any any closing words you want to give people some, if maybe they're new to this lifestyle, give them some words of encouragement? Uh, well, you know, you have talked at length about how you don't have to have carbs for pregnancy. I've talked about how you don't have to have carbs for performance and bodybuilding. Um, so I think any parting tips I would have would just be to accept the fact that you can function at a high rate and optimize your health and nutrition in a sustainable fashion with a ketogenic lifestyle. I mean, people have been trying to wiggle carbs in forever. They're, they're trying to justify this TKD or CKD or carb ups, and it's just not necessary. It's not needed. I mean, so fully believing that you can live a healthy life that's fulfilling uh, with a ketogenic approach is that's what I would that's what I would impart on anybody listening. Well, awesome! Well, tell everybody where they can find your your products and your your accounts. Yeah, so I'm I'm at Keto Savage, and uh, the the business is Keto Brick. So if you type in Keto Savage or Keto Brick, and then Crystal is the Lady Savage. So type in any one of those, and you'll find us. Yeah, you guys, there. He's very motivational, so make sure and follow uh, uh, Robert Sykes at the Keto Savage. Is it the Keto Savage or the Keto Savage? I uh, just Keto Savage. Okay, so no dots or anything. No, no, just right. just Keto Savage. 
All right. Well, you can find him over there. And if you guys have any questions, just leave them down below. And we appreciate you watching so much. And please share with a friend and subscribe. And let me know what you want my next video to be about. Thanks so much, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye.